You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is Brian McClanahan, your host, and this is Episode 85, covering the week of August 14th through August 18th, 2017. Glad to have you back on the program. Glad to be here. Before we get started, just want to remind you that if you do like this podcast, please share it around on social media. And you can find us on social media. You can find us on Facebook. You can like us there at Abbeville Institute or INST. You can uh, follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute or Abbeville INST. And you can subscribe to our YouTube page. Just go look for Abbeville Institute. Also, you can go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. And you can give us an email address, and we will put you on our email list with a free ebook, Kirkpatrick Sales Emancipation Hell. And by giving us an email address, you will get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. Also on our webpage, if you go to the top of the page under support and you click uh, memberships for individuals, you can give us a tax deductible donation. For as little as $3 a month or $25 a year for a student, you can become a member of the Abbeville Institute or $5 a month and $50 a year for a non-student. If you are a student, please sign up with an EDU email address. All of that will help us continue to explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition, continue to help keep this podcast going, the website going, and our programs going as well. So all of those things are on our website. We also have options for donating if you are a business or if you want to have some tor- some sort of plan giving uh, in your uh, program and your uh, plans for the future. Uh, so all of those things are out there. Please consider those things, and please help us continue to explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. We exist on your generous contributions alone. Okay, so let's talk about this week. We had a lot of good material this week, and um, some things that are, I think, important to discuss in terms of our understanding of the Southern tradition and Southern history. Uh, The first was a look at a a film uh, that was entitled Guns of Honor. This is written by Clyde Wilson, and he talked about how he used to have this film on a VHS tape, uh, and the description of the film said this, quote, a stellar cast including Martin Sheen, Christopher Atkins, and Jordan Pronchow, uh, I'm sorry, Watch now, excuse me, star in this fast and furious adventure set across the Rio Grande just after the Great Civil War. Defeated Confederate soldiers, branded outlaws by their own government, are recruited for one final mission to restore their lost glory. Glory, And aided by a beautiful former Southern spy, they are assigned to, re- to run guns to the Mexican government. After blasting it out with local rebels, these renegades must then pass through territory controlled by the invading French army. With nothing to lose, they ride bravely into battle, determined to regain their honor and prepared for anything that lies ahead. Uh, so there was the description of the Guns of Honor. Unfortunately, when Clyde says he got this uh, video and DVD, he tried to replace his VHS. Well, they replaced the video with a new film called Trigger Fast. Now, the cover of the film shows Sheen and Atkins standing in front of a waving Confederate flag. But this new film is nothing like the old Guns of Honor. And this film was released in 1994 before the modern pogroms against Southern symbols took place. And you can only assume that the reason they replaced this is because of the politically correct environment that we live in today. So uh, that is the problem with modern Hollywood. We've seen this. Uh, Actually, what's interesting, there was just an article the other day how there was a uh, cemetery in California, in Hollywood, California, uh, dedicated to Confederate soldiers, uh, uh, just a little over a dozen that had been buried there. And now that cemetery is going to remove the marker. Uh, so here you have Hollywood. Hollywood, for a long time, uh, had interest in uh, Confederate history, uh, c- the Confederate story. You had great actors playing Confederate soldiers. And there was, nothing, there was no shame in that. <clears throat> Everyone wanted to play the Confederates. No one really wanted to play the Union. And if you look at, for example, the Twilight Zone in the 1960s, perhaps two of their better episodes ever were about Confederate soldiers, uh, one being the, an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, which uh, is just a fantastic short story. And then they really did a good job making it into a, uh, a film or a, a, a show for the Twilight Zone. And um, 
it, it's it's this is where we've come though that you can't even uh, have <clears throat> actors play these things anymore uh, because it's so controversial. You know, in 1999 you had Ride with the Devil, which was blacklisted because it had a black Confederate in it. Uh, Jeffrey Hunt, who was a great actor, played a black Confederate soldier. You had Tobey Maguire. This was before he became famous. Uh, playing a number of other roles, including Spider-Man. Uh, he was the main character. Uh, you had uh, Skeet Ulrich, who was a great uh, great actor. Jewel, the singer, played uh, a a very important character in the film. It was directed, directed by Ang Lee, uh, which uh, he became famous after he uh, directed Brokeback Mountain, which was, of course, on a politically correct theme. Uh, and so you had all these great characters in it, um, and it was only shown in in certain theaters and then and then done away with uh but i think that um it was all political and so this is you know when you have you compare that for example to uh the latest film uh the latest films on the confederacy that all depict it to be in, in a negative light um you look at the free state of jones for example which was just an awful film we've already published a piece on it ripping it apart uh, but if you look at all of that and you compare it to how the Confederacy used to be portrayed, even into the late 90s, it's a much different situation than we have just 20 years later. Uh, and perhaps this uh, this switch, this old switcheroo of the films, was or is a result of this politically correct climate that we live in. Uh, you can't even have a film that shows Confederate soldiers in a positive light. Uh, it has to be negative, or they just have to kind of get rid of that uh, part of it. I, I do say that you know we had um, a great series on AMC entitled Hell on Wheels, which had a sympathetic Confederate soldier. The main character, Colin Bohannon, uh, was a very sympathetic portrayal of a Confederate soldier, and and um, uh, that was I think unique. And we're going to talk about Hollywood in a second on another piece that we had for the week and what Hollywood is now doing to portray the Confederacy moving forward. Uh, but this is where we've gotten to. So, so the, the, the climate around the Confederacy, uh, particularly from Hollywood or from the left-leaning side of America, uh, is one that is much more, much more hostile today than it was just 20 years ago. And that's unfortunate because we're never going to learn anything uh, if, and of course, how many people are walking around with Confederate ancestors? Um, <clears throat> or how much did the South contribute to the American experiment, to American character? And that's what I'll get into in the last piece of the week. But um, this, is, this is a really unfortunate time period in which we're all living. I think it's in some ways it's even more vicious than it was during Reconstruction or even the war itself. And the way that um, the uh, one, that one side is going after uh, Southern history and Southern tradition, not just Southern history, but I mean everything. It, it could be the Joan of Arc statue in New Orleans, which has been vandalized. Uh, and it, it goes beyond that. Uh, it's going in. It's, it could be the the horse for the USC mascot, University of Southern California mascot, which is named Traveler. Now they want to uh, rename the horse because General Lee's horse was named Traveler. So uh, this is <clears throat> we've gotten to a point that. Uh, everything is just pure madness. Uh, but that's, and, and, and I hope good people in America will start realizing this and pushing back because um, as as we all know, and as we've said on this podcast and as we've done on the, on the Institute, this is just the beginning. Uh, the Confederate symbols are low-hanging fruit and everything, as clear, it's clearly being done, is going to come under attack. Anything that smacks of uh, the South in one way or another going back into antebellum America is going to be under attack or exposed or portrayed as evil or wrong-headed. Uh, and another example of that is I, I received an article uh, through social media about Vanderbilt University and all of the uh, slaveholders that were in, in, involved in the establishment of Vanderbilt and the names of buildings and these type of things. Well, you can't find an institution in the South that wasn't that way, uh, particularly if it, was, um, if it was established before the war or right after the war. Uh, it's just you're not going to have it because all of these people were involved and they were all prominent members of Southern society. And so this is what's going to be there. And if we want to tear all these things down, you're going to have to tear down the entire fabric of the United States. 
uh, from the founding period forward uh, up until you get to about the middle of the 20th century. And I think that there's a group that really wants to do that. They're, they're certainly interested in rewriting American history uh, and starting American history around 1970. I mean, that's, that's the goal. Uh, but if I, I think if Americans start waking up and realizing this, they'll put the brakes on some of this stuff. And they really need to put the brakes on it beginning with Confederate symbols because um, this, is, this is, again, only the beginning. If you take these things down, they're coming for your symbols next. Uh, and this is clearly the case and how people talk about these things. So uh, the, the piece on Tuesday was another in our review, our Abbeville Review of Books. And it was entitled A Series of What Ifs. It was written by Jason Corbell. And it's a review of the book Cry Havoc by Nelson Langford. This book came out in 2008, so it's not, not new. It's almost a decade old. Uh, but the thing that's really interesting about this book is that um, Langford actually has a, a very much uh, a position that would be in line with, say, uh, the Blundering Generation School. Uh, he does not subscribe to the Kenneth Stamps, the Eric Foners, these type of people, the James McPhersons. Uh, Langford actually blames both sides for leading to the war. And, uh, I mean, this is, this is sacrilege now. You can't say that anymore. But Langford does, and he does a very good job doing it. In fact, this book uh, was put out by Penguin Books, so it's a, it is a popular history. Uh, it is a mass consumption book. It is not an academic book. And I think that's what makes it better. And as I've said on this podcast before, you know, we should think about writing popular histories and, and getting into that, uh, that part of Southern history because that is the way you can help change minds. But more people read popular histories than they do academic histories. It's just uh, a fact. But what he does here is show that all the things leading to the war could have been avoided. In fact, he essentially says this is the crooked road to the Civil War. He says that Lincoln could have avoided the war. He believes Jefferson Davis could have avoided the war. And uh, if you look at uh, you know Charles Rowland's uh, American Iliad, which is a great little book that could be used as a textbook on the war, uh, he he does the same thing. He says, well, I mean, Lincoln could have could have put the brakes on. So could Davis at points, and so maybe both men share the blame and actually leading to uh, to bloodshed, though I think that uh, Roland would, would clearly say that Lincoln had more of a of a role than did Davis. Uh, but certainly, uh, the blundering generation did blunder into the war. It could have been avoided. Uh, there were still slave states in the Union in 1861, and perhaps uh, had some uh, real efforts at compromise been made, or uh, you know some some real statesmanship been practiced, we may not have had the war. You may have had a a Southern Confederacy of seven states on the border of the United States, but you wouldn't have had Virginia in the Confederacy, for example, or even North Carolina uh, or Tennessee. Uh, this just wouldn't have happened. Uh, you would have had a Confederacy, uh, a, a cotton Confederacy. Uh, and rice and sugar. I mean, that's what your that's what the main crops would have been, and perhaps they would have come back in the Union at some point. Even you might have said, look, if real statesmanship had been practiced uh, in December of 1860, only South Carolina would have seceded from the Union, and probably South Carolina could have been brought back in. Uh, there's no doubt about it. So, did the war have to happen? Absolutely not. And again, I think this is a position that if you take that that if you make take that stance today. Uh, you are on the fringe of American history. But for a long time, that was the dominant, uh, dominant belief in the American Historical Academy. And when you look at Randall and Craven, uh, they were saying you know, the war could have been avoided, that it was uh, fools on both sides who brought the conflict, and it didn't need to happen. Uh, and, of course, uh, the thing I like about this Langford book, and uh, what Corbel points out, is that, uh, you know, the, the war really hinged on Virginia and Maryland. And uh, the best book that's ever been written on, on Maryland and the war is Bart Talbert's uh, The South First Casualty, which you can't, I mean, uh, it is uh, out of print and uh, hard to get. But if you can get a copy of it, uh, it is fantastic. And he, he gets into the entire situation leading to uh, Maryland's coercion to stay in the Union. Uh, the Union's coercion of Maryland to stay in the Union. So uh, it's a wonderful book, but I think that uh, everyone should pick up 
this book by Nelson Langford. Uh, and uh, as, as Corbel points out, you know, he is he is a uh, a nationalist. There's there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, he he is a nationalist, but uh, he is even handed in his treatment of the South and the period leading to the war. So uh, he doesn't place all the blame on on Southern slave owners. And even though he says slavery is 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 in his mind the primary cause which led to the sectional conflict. He thinks blame should be passed around for everyone involved and not just uh, on Southerners themselves. So it's well worth your time uh, to read the book and uh, see this uh, kind of a new manifestation of the uh, blundering generation thesis. Um, so uh, the piece on, on Wednesday, really great piece, short piece by Bo Trawick, a monumental spin. And this gets into that idea that I was talking about before, how how uh, integral the, the South was and slavery was, in, for, in fact, into the American fabric. And if, but unfortunately, the modern narrative seems to place all the blame on the South and not the Northern complicity in the entire institution. And he says, uh, he calls the myth of American history, which proclaims that, quote, the Civil War was all about slavery, the righteous North waged to free the slaves, and the evil South fought to keep them. End of story. Any questions? And he says, well, yes, yeah, something doesn't compute here. If the North were waging a war on slavery, why didn't she wage a war on New England cotton mills and their profits from slave-picked cotton? Or on New England, New York and Boston, the largest African slave trading ports in the world, according to the January 1862 New York Journal of Commerce? Or on northern shipyards that outfitted the slave ships. Or on New England distilleries that made run, rum from slave-harvested sugarcane to use for barter on the African coast. Or on the African slavers themselves, such as the Kingdom of Dahomey, which, who captured their fellow Africans and sold them into slavery in the first place. Uh, why didn't they issue the Emancipation Proclamation at the beginning of the war? Because, of course, the war wasn't just about slavery. Uh, it was about, the war itself was about saving the Union. That was Lincoln's position. But, of course, the Union at what cost? Uh, and so, as he says, the war for the North brought about the Gilded Age, for the South grinding poverty in a land-laid waste. Uh, for the blacks, a recent study of neglected military and Freedmen's Bureau records have revealed that between 1862 and 1870, a million ex-slaves, or 25% of the population, died of starvation, disease, and neglect under their northern liberators. Uh, Lincoln's point in all of this, when asked about former slaves, is that they had to root, hog, or die. And so black enf enfranchisement, like black emancipation, was merely an incidental tool, not the point of the North's conquest. And once she had achieved it, the North abandoned her black puppets to the upheaval she had wrought in southern society and turned her attention to the Plains Indians, who were in the way of her transcontinental railroads. Um, and so this is where, and I think the nice, the great thing about this particular piece is he gives you a nice bibliography of several books to read on this particular topic, which people say, well, where are your sources? Who are your sources in all of this? Uh, I can't, I mean, these are all just lost cause books. Um, simply not true. Uh, he, <laughs> he actually cites the boys and, and um, uh, Ann Farrow, who uh, and uh, Joel Lang and Jennifer Frank, who wrote um, *Complicity*, uh, how the North promoted, promulgated, and I'm sorry, prolonged and profited from slavery. Uh, and uh, so these are not just you know, <laughs> these are not just uh, lost cause narratives. Uh, they are books that cut across the ideological uh, spectrum. And I think that's the important thing to understand. Um, there's so much information out there, even in books that uh, you would say the, the uh, narrative is a bit skewed by the ideological preference of the author. But there's a lot of good information in those books. And, um, you know, we need to understand that. And so the spin is, and this is the point, the spin of the current narrative is this, I call it the Lincolnian myth, but he calls it the myth of American history. Uh, but more than that, it's, it's this nationalist myth in American history. Uh, as I point out in my forthcoming How Alexander Hamilton Screwed Up America, what if the entire narrative is backwards? 
What if it wasn't really states' rights that were the problem, but nationalism? Because what you had at times was this nationalism, which was thinly disguised northern sectionalism, but nationalism coming in and grinding down the original Constitution under the original understanding. So it was always the the originalists who were defending the original Constitution against this nationalist push led by Alexander Hamilton and then later codified by the federal court system. But that is the that is the true narrative. That is the real narrative. It was the nationalists who were in the minority and who were the problems from the beginning. Lincoln as a nationalist was the problem. It it wasn't the southern push for states' rights that was a problem. That could have resulted in a very limited southern confederacy with the rest of the union staying intact. And I always point back to James Byard of Delaware, who I focused on for my dissertation, saying, look, why are you saying the government is destroyed? We still have, we still have a government. We still have a constitution. We still have all our banking and financial houses. We still have an army and navy. What has been destroyed by allowing the southern states to go? We still have all these things. Nothing has been destroyed. We still have the union. We still have the constitution. But again, the spin is that the, somehow the union was destroyed. It wasn't destroyed. It still existed but without seven states. Just like the British Empire still existed without the 13 British North American colonies. It still existed. It hadn't died. And in fact, it became more powerful in the ensuing century. So uh, it, it's, it's looking at history backwards, in my opinion, to look at the war as or to look at the South and this push for states' rights or decentralization as the real problem. No, it was nationalism that was the real problem. And in that vein, you have the piece by Gail Jarvis uh, entitled, Is 19th Century Slavery Harming 21st Century Black Americans? Uh, and there's a couple of new uh, series coming out on HBO and uh, Amazon. One on HBO entitled Confederate and the other on Amazon Black America. And the premise of each is that what if the South had actually won the war or in the case of Amazon's Black America, what if there was an independent Black Republic in the South? What would this do? This is kind of a dystopic or maybe utopic, I mean it depends on your perspective, uh, image of America in a post-war world and a post-bellum period where the South either won or there was a separate black republic. Now, this that position in black America, um, that's interesting because there was actually, actually a man named Pap Singleton uh, in the post-bellum period. This is something that's often not discussed. But he was interested in a black republic because in his mind, the, the Republican-controlled government had failed them. And this is uh, where you get into people like Hiram Rhodes Rebels, who was the first black member of the United States Senate, uh, was elected from Mississippi. But he said the exact same thing in the 1870s. Look, I'm a Republican, but the Republican Party has failed us. We're being used as pawns. And so you had people like uh, Pap Singleton, who wanted to move west and create some type of uh, independent black state. That's secession. Uh, and it shows that there was a lot of discontent with the Republican Party. Uh, and, of course, Singleton was also not happy with the climate in the South following the war. But um, it's an interesting position. There are people that are talking about trying to carve out a, a black uh, state today out of the South and areas that are predominantly black or close to it. Um, and uh, so this is not too far-fetched. Uh, but it shows, I think the thing about this is, is where we've gotten to. And somehow this is what you would call a victim with a capital V. And when you look at monuments and what people are saying about them, that somehow these things are victimizing people with a capital V and that their entire plight is because of uh, the Confederacy or because of the uh, antebellum period. And uh, that's not that's not putting any... Uh, any uh, worth in yourself uh, for getting out of these things. And I think it fails to recognize how the uh, how prosperous uh, the American black community has, has become. Uh, and it, it's the, the opportunities in America are across the board. 
uh, for anyone. Really, if you have an idea, an initiative, you can go do just about anything, no matter who you are in the United States today. And so uh, when you look at this victim mentality or this victim idea, uh, and that's kind of what, these, what, these, what Jarvis is getting at, um, it's a very poor portrayal of the um, situation of black Americans today. Uh, the 19th century has nothing to do with the plight of black Americans in the 21st century. Um, and I, I think that this is, this is where uh, we, we get into you know, modern politics and what's going on in society. But uh, there are some, the way Hollywood is portraying things, and I, we have yet to see how these, how these shows are going to be uh, set up. Uh, but uh, I think that in some ways, I mean, if you look at the premise of black America, there won't be a victim mentality there. Though in some ways there will be, because it's going to show that if only the only way black Americans could have been successful is they were completely out of the United States. And it's simply just, uh, you're not even looking at America today to see that. Um, but uh, Jarvis brings up, poses a very good question. Uh, is, is the legacy of slavery the real problem in American society? And I think you can conclusively say, if you look at it objectively, no. It's not at all. Uh, and maybe it was Reconstruction that did more to harm blacks uh, than anything else in American history. And the, the aftermath of the war and how uh, black Americans were used as pawns in a bigger political game, how the South was impoverished, and uh, it was very difficult for white and black Southerners to, uh, to gain a foothold in American society. And I think you know Philip Lee's Southern Reconstruction does a nice job in portraying that. Uh, and maybe it was that. Um, and so uh, we don't often look at the entirety of history. We just focus on, you know, a, a period of time uh, that uh, 150 years later uh, it may not really have much of an impact on, uh, on the plight of, of black Americans today. So uh, these are things, and I think that, you know, other people have, have written on this and said, well, maybe it was the legacy of, of the welfare state that, that uh, has had a, a harmful impact. Uh, there's all kinds of, of uh, different studies to show uh, different causation of uh, poverty in America. Uh, but um, clearly in all of these, uh, not all of them, but I mean some of them are going to say, well, it's the legacy of slavery, but most of them, it's going to point the finger somewhere else. Now, we ended up the week with a piece by yours truly entitled uh, Lion Gardener Tyler and uh, Southern History. And, and this was a lecture I delivered at the summer school. The lecture, of course, is available online now for free, so you can listen to it. But uh, briefly, because of time, uh, what I do in this particular piece is talk about Southern historians of the early 20th century, notably Line Gardner Tyler, but also uh, amateurs like uh, Lizzie Rutherford and John Cussens. Now, I've already written about John Cussens on the website. In fact, this lecture pulled from that piece. Uh, but uh, I'd never written about Rutherford before, or Lion Gardner Tyler, or the South and the Building of the Nation series, which was a, a multi-volume uh, collection of Southern history published in the early 20th century, in fact, I think 1909, uh, that uh, was groundbreaking for its time. And it, in, it involved a number of professional Southern historians, also amateurs. And my point in this particular piece is, again, to encourage Southerners to write their own history. Because if you look at how Southern history is written by people not from the South, uh, as uh, one of the contributors says, you get these whimsical tales that are just completely fantastic that never existed. Uh, and Southerners might be guilty of myth-making at times. Southerners might, tell poor, might write poor history, and there's no doubt even Lizzie Rutherford had mistakes in her histories. It's, it's, it's unquestioned. You can find them. But... Uh, they are at least going to try to be more accurate uh, than uh, Northerners, and particularly in the early 20th century. And, of course, all of these books, uh, all of this early 20th century Southern history is often blasted for its open racism. Well, that's, that's not an intellectual critique. That's an ideological critique designed to marginalize a work of history. Now, it's just like if you go to graduate school, you're not going to read the Dunning School of Reconstruction. You'll, you'll know about it. Uh, and I remember when I was in graduate school, you know, Dun the Dunning School or E. Merton Coulter's The South During Reconstruction 
well, uh, you know, there are the good uh, older versions of Reconstruction, but now we're going to read Foner. And I remember uh, uh, my, one of my professors there, and I might have said this on the podcast before, uh, he, he showed a, a chart and how narrow the view of Reconstruction has become. Uh, when you look at Dunning's work on Reconstruction, it's very broad. It, it encompassed, the, the title is Reconstruction, Political and Economic. And so it was not just focused on the economic uh, situation in the South. He also talked about how this impacted the North and the political story as well. And then all of the Dunning students, uh, people like Walter Fleming, yes, all these people were racist, but so was most of America in 1909. Uh, and this is the other thing about, about monuments. Um, the early 20th century witnessed a surge in monument building across the United States. For example, the, uh, the Lincoln Memorial was uh, conceptualized in the early 20th century, right about the same time all of these southern memorials were being put up. So was the Lincoln Memorial. And, I mean, was that erected because of white supremacy or racism? Uh, you had a large number of Union veteran monuments erected in the late 19th and early 20th century, just like you had in the South. Uh, you had uh, you had the uh, carving of Mount Rushmore, in the in this time period, uh, just a, along with Stone Mountain, uh, so I mean this was a, a period of time where people were very introspective and they were looking at all of American history. And of course, if you're in the South at the time, uh, you know when people say, "Well, these things were erected to uh, to show the the legacy of of white supremacy or Jim Crow," that was a that was granted at the time. I mean, nobody there was no real threat to that in 1909. That was a way of life. Uh, so why were they so interested in defending that? They weren't. Uh, there was no challenge to that in the South or elsewhere. Nobody was talking about ending these things in 1909. Uh, and if you look at the dedications of these monuments, they were all about uh, you know, the, the history of the South and talking about the valor of Confederate soldiers and the, and the, and the cause for which they fought. And they mention you know, decentralization and states' rights in the original Constitution. It's the, the principles of 76. They talk about these things on the monuments. And a lot of these things were erected before there was really any challenge to us, to uh, the prevailing attitudes of the day. So uh, north or south, I mean, it, it just, just didn't happen. So uh, when Southerners wrote their own history, they actually wrote very good histories Yes, they're, they're from a perspective today that most Americans find abhorrent uh, in terms of their views on race. But uh, there's a lot of good stuff here. And I think we do our, ourselves a disservice as, as historians and Americans not to read this. I mean, there was one chapter by Alfred Stone, which is just fantastic. It was in Alfred Stone is considered one of the most virulent racists uh, of, the early, of the early 20th century Southern historians. But in this chapter, he wrote... It was on free black labor before the war, and it's very sympathetic. Uh, and it's a field that had not even been discussed in 1909. This is coming from a guy who supposedly uh, just hated, that, that word's a very strong word, by the way, hated black Americans. Uh, and I think that uh, when you say hate, I mean, you're implying that these people just despise the ground that Black Americans walked on. They didn't even want them around. But you're talking about the South when in some states that's half the population or close to it. So uh, this is, it's, it's a strange situation we've gotten in and how we use language uh, today. Uh, but th I mean, there are so many uh, good essays in these, in these books uh, that um, you know, it's, it's important to, to read them. And there's good information here. You, can you, and, I, and I posed the question in the last essay that I published. Can you study these people, Southerners, uh, antebellum, postbellum Southerners up until the 1960s or 70s, uh, and look at their views without having to always focus on race? Did they have anything valuable to contribute to America? And of course, uh, yes, they did. Uh, outs I mean, we, we can say, all right, well, they, they were racist. I mean, they have views that we don't, we don't hold today. But did they, have, did they write good histories? Many of them did. They wrote excellent histories, and they, had, they brought up some very valid points. You know, Line Gardner Tyler and his little essay, Virginia First, brings up all kinds of wonderful things about Virginia history and how important Virginia was to the fabric of America. Not just the South, but to America. And how Virginia 
was America at one time. He also wrote an essay for Time magazine where he just ripped apart uh, this, this attack in time on his, on his uh, father, uh, John Tyler. I mean, that was his, that was his, that was his father. Uh, and uh, Line Gardner Tyler was the president of the College of William and Mary. And uh, how, you know, Time Magazine says, you know, John Tyler was a wimp compared to Abraham Lincoln. It's just simply not true. Uh, one thing that Lion Gardner Tyler points out, and I think it's important, I'm going to say it on this podcast, is why the tariff issue was important in 1861. It's not because, as many historians will suggest, the South paid, quote unquote, 80% of the tariff. It's because the South represented a free trade region on the doorstep of the North. And so the North would have lost a tremendous amount of revenue to a low tariff Southern Federal Republic. And so that was the issue. Not how much money the South was paying, but the amount of money the North would lose because of the free trade South on the border. So uh, that's important. But... um, you know, it's important to, to read early 20th century Southern history, and not, not just that. Anyone listening to this podcast who's a young historian or even a, an accomplished historian, they should, everyone should learn how to write and learn how to communicate and, and think about popular history because more people read popular histories than they do uh, academic works. And so I think that's a valuable lesson. If you look at Lion Gardner Tyler, he wrote a lot of popular history, and people read this stuff. Uh, he didn't just write academic works that nobody's going to pay attention to uh, 20 years from now. So all of that said, uh, we can explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. We can we can separate these things. We can talk about these issues. Uh, and, of course, the PC police are trying not to let that happen. But uh, I think that, uh, you know, most Americans don't want to see Confederate memorials or monuments torn down. They're not, they don't have a negative view of Southern symbols. Uh, they, they don't like the agitators. And it's our job to ensure that uh, we are uh, accurate, accurately portraying Southern history for all of its good and bad. I mean, every tradition has good and bad, everything. Accurately portraying that history and uh, not just the bad, but also the good. And that's what we do here at the Institute. We explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. Until next time, good day.